What you're about to experience is a free, worldwide, interactive broadcast from Ontario, Canada. We broadcast live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Get your questions in. Join the community chat room at www.category5.tv or email us at live at category5.tv. And now, let's begin. Here's your host, Robbie Ferguson. Welcome to episode number 166 of Category 5 Technology TV. I am your host, Robbie Ferguson. Eric, how are you, buddy? I am well. And you, sir? Good. Hey, folks. Hey. Nice to have you here. It's uh, Tuesday, November 23rd. Yeah. Wow. 23rd, 2010. Stuff. Sorry, folks, but uh, we're looking at one month and two days till Christmas. They're threatening snow in Barrie, Ontario tonight. Just threatening. Just threatening. We haven't had too much. But uh, it's, it's, it was like 13 degrees today. C. Yeah. That was kind of nice. Yeah, that's that's cool. the weather for tonight. And moving along. Uh, tonight we are going to be uh, <laughs> we're going to be talking about DDWRT, uh, from selecting our router to actually installing it, setting it up, and using the free firmware that lets you buy a cheaper router and add features that are that of a more expensive router. Sweet. Also, we're going to be learning how to mount a pogo plug to our Windows and Linux device. You remember last week uh, we had a yes. question there. I left the question in your inbox so we can go back oh, over okay. it again uh, at some point tonight. But uh, we didn't actually get to refer back to the original question because that was a two-parter. Um, so we'll, we'll attend to that tonight. We will, too. Definitely. That was uh, Rock You Up North. That's right. It? Yeah. Or Rock Up North. Something like that. We'll be dealing with that tonight, so check it out. Uh, yeah, we've got that brother printer to give away. We've got Hillary, uh, who's joining us tonight. Hill, how are you tonight? Hey, everybody. I am doing fabulous, and I'm excited for Category 5, as always. It's good to see you. You're looking quite a bit uh, higher frame rate tonight. It's looking better. Thank you. Good job. Yes, good job. we've got it together over here. Things are good on this live location. <laughs> Just uh, fill us in what, what uh, is coming up in the news this evening, Hillary, if you could. Well, certainly. Coming up in the newsroom, people, we've got a lot of exciting things going on. Google Maps' bike directions are coming to Canada. And yesterday's iOS 4.2 release brings new features to current Apple devices, especially the iPad. Google Chrome OS-based netbooks will not be ready in time for Christmas. Give the gift of digital literature this holiday season. And if you can believe it, Microsoft Windows operating system celebrated 25 years on Saturday. Stick around for the latest news from the Category 5 TV newsroom. Thanks, Hillary. So yeah, we've got lots going on tonight. Did you celebrate? Windows? On Saturday? Yeah. yeah. We'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, through a little party. I didn't get invited. Okay. Oh my. Could you, that would be ironic, wouldn't it? Yeah. Anyway. Invite all our... I actually commented on the news article on the newsroom website, category5.tv slash newsroom. I, I posted a comment um, just saying that, like, where Windows has come from and my first experiences with Windows and when I actually got into Linux. Um, so you can check that out in the Category 5 newsroom, category5.tv slash newsroom, and there is a chance for you to comment on any of the news stories there. All right. How's your week been? It's been just dandy so far. Yeah, good, yeah. good. Seems you're always playing hockey. Well, that's later tonight. Yeah? Yeah. So Got my gear in the car. Good, good. <laughs> and I see you've been tweeting like a madman once oh. again. Oh! Oh, wait a minute. I knew there was I think the I last time you tweeted was I that. I was traumatized by uh, yeah. <laughs> the last, uh, or the second last tweet Brilliant. I sent out, yes. All right. Welcome uh, to Category 5. You can find us in the chat room at www.category5.tv. We'd love to have you there. Uh, you can get your questions in live. You can email me live at category5.tv if you're watching this after the fact. But certainly if you're watching live, uh, we'd love to hear from you in the chat room at category5.tv or on Freenode in the room Category 5. So there? Right. So there. All right. Well, <laughs> should we... Uh Maybe go back to uh, some questions we were looking at? Yeah, anything at all? Well. He's still asking permission. After all this time, he's still asking permission. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm the new kid here. Maybe yeah. I'll just drink coffee Hillary, you and remember sit what back it was like. Quiet. You remember what it was like? Like, can I please read this now? Wow. She's, she's, got, the, she's got the confidence now, though. <laughs> Hi, yep, Hillary. That's, uh, yeah, keep going, Eric. You're doing a great job. Don't <laughs> even worry. Sure is, sure is. Okay, well. Shall we go into that 
Uh, Pogo, sure, Pogo? You're, you're. Okay, well, I'm here to answer the questions. He's here to ask no, we're, them. We're not sure if this is Ro Claire, but this is Rock up north. I think we're gonna we're gonna go with that. Hey, yeah. All right. So, after watching a few shows where he talked about the Pogo plug, he went and purchased one. Brilliant. He's very happy with the device. The problem I'm having is I can't install the drive into my Ubuntu 10.10 .10 netbook. I downloaded the TGZ file, and that's as far as I went. Okay. Could you go through the setup with the terminal program? <clears throat> I would love to. Okay. I'd love to show you how that's done, and certainly a good opportunity for people who are on the fence about the pogo plug, especially with Christmas coming. Great little stocking stuffer, so to speak. Stocking stuffer. <laughs> be a really good investment as far as Christmas gifts go. Uh, so check this out, we'll, uh, we'll take a look. Um, the Pogo Plug is a device that lets you hook up your external hard drive in such a way that you can access it from anywhere in the world through your high-speed internet connection. So you've got a USB hard drive, you plug it in, or multiple hard drives, and have the ability to mount those to your computer from anywhere through an encrypted, secure connection. So. As far as for off-site backups and storing your stuff redundantly across multiple hard drives or pogo plugs, or just for the fact that you can have access to your files from anywhere, just for that simple convenience, uh, just so that you can print from your iPad or from another device that, uh, you know, like an Android phone or something, where you can actually send it to a printer that's connected to your pogo plug, or just have access to those files. It's, it's a truly brilliant device. It's got so much... Uh, functionality, but it's really, it's, it's only limited by what you can creatively do with it because it is really just a mass storage connection for your hardware. So that said, my Windows computers can access the hard drive through the Pogo plug as if it was connected directly into USB. Very nice. Right? So uh, that, can, that hard drive could physically be anywhere in the world. As long as it's got a high-speed internet connection plugged into the Pogo plug, I can actually access it through a mount point on my Windows computer. So my P drive, basically. Uh, with my Linux computer, I can create a mount point and do the same thing. I can access it just like it's a hard drive on my computer. So I use that for off-site backups quite a bit. You can put one uh, at a family member's house, and uh, they can put one at your house, and you can exchange the ability to have off-site backups, even synchronize the two devices together with Active Sync. So very cool features. I know a lot of people who are joining us in the chat room uh, have already uh, taken the plunge and uh, gone out and purchased a Pogo plug. They're they're extremely affordable. There's no service fees and no ongoing costs or anything. You just buy the hardware and you've got the whole feature set. And I think one of the impressive things about Pogo plug, you hear about all the new versions that they're bringing out, but uh, it's always backward compatible. So as they bring out a new hardware device, sure the new hardware comes with new features like the new Pogo plug Pro has Wi-Fi built in, but the old Pogo plug you can get the Wi-Fi dongle in it and it works just the same. So the software is all compatible. And, and even the first gen Pogo plug, I've got one of those, just the little brick, the little white brick. Um, all of the features that they've added to all the second and third and fourth generation Pogo plugs are also through firmware updates that automatically occur. Uh, those features have been added to my old Pogo plug as well. So you're never locked in. You never have to feel like, oh, I need to upgrade to the latest Pogo plug because you're always getting the latest downloads from the Pogo plug server. It automatically updates itself, gets the newest version. Very it's nice. very cool. In Canada, you can buy them through pogoplug.com. Led Zepp is just asking in the chat room. Uh, Cal Hydro mentioning that, uh, that they love their Pogo plug. I have to agree. Seriously do, seriously do. Um, so looking at the Pogo plug, on a Windows system, you install the application, which you're going you're gonna to be able to download just by logging into your Pogo plug. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually go there. I'm going to go to mypogoplug.com. This, you'll, you'll note, is a secure server. Okay. And I'll just log into that Pogo plug device. So once I've logged into my Pogo plug, I've got access to the drive. <clears throat> Pardon me. And you'll see up at the top, there's a button that says Downloads. When I click on that, it's going to give me access to Pogo plug drive for Windows, Mac, and Linux. As well as, pardon me, as I was saying, there are apps for your mobile devices as well, from BlackBerry to Palm, and uh, of course the iPhone and Android devices as well. Um, so there, there are no limitations as far as 
device compatibility. It's they really worked hard to make it work with everything. So that's pretty fantastic. Now looking at this, what I would want to do on my Windows system is simply download the executable for my computer. That's going to give me the EX or the MSI. It's MSI. Yeah, but it detects that I'm on a 64-bit oh, okay. platform. And oh. so in this case, that's what it's going to give me. So so now I'm on Linux on the uh, demo system there, but I have actually installed this on my Windows computer. And you'll see that once it's installed, I can simply log into the service. This is a program that now launches when I boot up my Windows 7 computer. <laughs> once I log in, you'll see that uh, I can set it up to support multiple drive mode. And instantly, I've got this P drive. And you'll see the, the device called No Name there. That's actually just my flash card that I plugged in just for the sake of the demonstration. It's a, a 1 gig. It's showing as 810 megs. You'll see there in the, uh, in the properties. It's just like an 810 meg drive. And, and remember, this is mounted on my P. So my P drive in Windows 7. So I can access this just by going to that, that uh, drive association. And this can be done if, if I was on a laptop. I could be anywhere in the world, sitting at an internet cafe, and my P drive would still connect me to this drive. So I'm going to create a folder here called test. And remember, this is creating it on my pogo plug on that flash drive. And I'll throw a little text document in here. And this text document is actually being written to that external hard drive, or my flash drive in this case. But to me, it's just being created on the pogo plug. So I've just added that hello testing pogo plug to this text file. And that's all there is to it. There's no, it works just like a hard drive. Now I'm going to log back into that mypogoplug.com using the same credentials. And you'll notice that instantly I'm going to actually have access to the, the very folder and, and file that I just created. Not only that, but you'll also notice at the top that Pogoplug is actually uh, it's rendering the media, that pink bar up at the top. And here's my test folder. And there's my text.txt, uh, or test.txt. And you'll notice Pogoplug automatically renders the preview. And there is the actual file, which I can then download or whatever I want to do. I've got instant access to that. It's brilliant. Brilliant. Oh, so that's how it works on a Windows system. It's fantastical. Mm -hmm. right? And like I say, if you've got that laptop computer, you take that laptop anywhere. You could be sitting on the beach in Florida. Oh. Under these lights, I'm, I'm feeling yeah. it. I'm yeah. feeling it. Uh, you could be sitting on the beach as long as you've got a high-speed internet connection. It could be like a Wi-Fi stick from uh, from your your cell phone provider, and you'd have access to that Pogo Plug drive. Somebody could steal your laptop then, and all of your data is safe because it's actually stored at home here in Canada. Very so nice. the, see, see what I mean? Like there's just so many different cool things about the Pogo Plug. You could have a netbook. As long as you've got Wi-Fi access to it, it could have a little 32 uh, gigabyte uh, solid state drive. And you could use the Pogo plug to give it much more space, terabytes of storage space, right? As long as you have an internet connection. As long as you've got that high speed internet connection. So then you drop that, that netbook. You don't want to. But if it happens, you don't lose any data. It's on your Pogo plug safely in your How basement or whatever. How normal termination like that? Are you? Uh no problem. No. Because the device itself is physically connected to the pogo plug, okay. not so to the, the computer. Whatever file you're working on, you may. Well, theoretically, right? If you, in any case, if you stop data transmission in the middle of a save of a terabyte file yeah. <laughs> or a gigabyte file, right? But, uh, but that's, you know, that's not really going to happen for the guy. have a terabyte file yet. Well, you know what I mean. It'd be a biggie. Goodness me. A biggie. So, so imagine you're on holidays or something, and, you, and you've got your, your laptop computer, and you pop in the camera card from your digital camera, and you copy everything over to the P drive, your pogo plug. So now you've got a backup of all your photos that you just took on your vacation before you've even headed home, and it's stored on your pogo plug safely at home. Mm -hmm. So even right then, and then you can share it with your friends and family from your vacation. Nothing to it. So there's just there's like I could go on and on about how feature rich the Pogo Plug is and what you can do with it. But now we want to learn about uh, getting this to work on Linux. Here I am in Ubuntu Linux. All right, and this it's is going like to work. A whole different world. It's a whole different experience of chippy goodness. Here we go. Pogo Plug drive for Linux. Okay. 
it's again detected my operating system version is 64-bit. I'm good to go. So it's given me the TGZ or the targa file. The, this is a compressed tar and gzip format. So just basically that's like the equivalent of a zip file in Windows. Okay. So I'm going to open that file. And you'll see that now I've got just a file with Pogo Plug FS. So I'm going to I'm going to do this as if this was something that you were actually doing on your Windows computer. So you've got your Pogo Plug or your Linux computer, I should say. Uh, you've got your Pogo Plug set up. You've got your drive connected, and you want to be able to access that as if it was physically connected to your hard drive, just like we did with the Windows box just just a moment ago. So there's the file. Okay. What I want to do is I want to right click on Pogo Plug FS and go Extract. And it's going to ask me, hey, where do you want to save it? What I would normally do is I create a folder called Scripts because I'm organized that way. So I've created a folder called Scripts by clicking on Create Folder. And you'll notice that this is in the Robbie folder or it will be in your home folder. Okay. So now I'm going to extract it. We're going to use Scripts as my example. And if I go show the files, you'll see there is my Pogo Plug FS file. I'm going to do this all through Terminal. Because uh, lately, you've, you've noticed that I've been using Terminal a little bit more. So I want you to get a little bit more comfortable with Terminal. Uh, we could right click on that file and go Properties and set the permissions to be executable. That's fine. What I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to actually bring up my Terminal. Applications, Accessories, Terminal. Okay? And we know that that is in a folder called Scripts in my home folder. So I'm going to type CD Scripts, CD for Change Directory. And it's case sensitive. So if I put a capital S on there, I have to use a capital S when I go CD. In this case, it's all lowercase. So now I go ls, and that's like the dos dir command. It's going to show me the files that are in here. And you'll notice if I go dot slash pogo plug fs and hit enter, it says, oh, it's actually executable already. It would, uh, if it wasn't executable, it would give me an error. But just in case, what I would do is I would go chmod plus x, just for the sake of the demonstration. I'm going to go chmod plus x for executable pogo plug fs. So now we know that it's executable. In my case, it actually was already executable. So now what we want to do, with any uh, bash command, any uh, Linux program, there's usually the ability to go dash dash help. So see what I typed there? I typed pogo plug fs, that's the name of the file I just downloaded, dash dash help with a space between them. And now it's telling me all the things that it can do, or all the command line arguments that I can throw in there. The main ones that I'm going to need are user, password, mount point. Okay, so what I want to do, is I want to first create a mount point. So let's we we learned this last week. Uh, sudo so that we can be a super user. Make dir slash media slash let's call it pogo plug. Okay, so I'm going to create a, a mount point in my media folder called pogo plug. Asking me for my password for the sudo command. And there we go. So now if I do an ls, which again is like a directory listing so that we can see what files are in there. If I go ls slash media, you'll see that I have one called pogo plug. And I still got my fake DVD from the last week when we did that demonstration. So po with pogo plug there, now we have a mount point that we can mount our pogo plug to. So I'm going to type dot slash, because I want to run a command in the current folder, pogo plug. I'm just going to type pog and hit my tab button. And that's going to fill in the rest dash dash user, and this is where you enter your email address that is associated with your Pogo Plug account, test at category5.tv, dash dash password, and this is plain text. I'm going to enter my password as test123 is what I've entered there. So this is actually the password that I've got on my Pogo Plug account. And now I want to set the mount point, dash dash mount point slash media slash Pogo plug. Remember, it's case sensitive, so I need to have a capital P. I hit enter on that, and you'll see that it's going through a bunch of stuff. I'm not sure. sure yeah, I'm not sure if it took or not, but I'm going to now back it at, uh, at Nautilus. I'm going to go into my media folder, go into Pogo plug, and it didn't take just yet. So let's see if it requires, let's see if there's any error message that tells me what happened there. But just first thing I'm going to check is whether it requires sudo. Application gracefully exiting. It gracefully exited. I like that. Let's so let's make sure. And you can read, you know, read what it's telling us here. So let's see. Error with certificate at depth three. Here we 
we are. I'm just double checking my settings. And I'll just make sure again that I've entered the right command here. So dot slash pogo plug fs dash dash help is how we get that help. So I'm using user, password, and mount point. So that should be correct. Password. Oh, and see now I've I've found the error in my ways here. So this will. I entered test. I'm actually demo. You'll remember when I logged into Pogoplug, my email address is demo at category5.tv. Set this up very quickly just for the sake of the demonstration. So now if I hit enter, it's not going to exit out with an error message. It's actually going to go through a bunch of stuff. Unless I'm wrong. Let's double check. <laughs> Mount failed. We'll get there. I'm typing mount just to see if it's already mounted at some other location. And here will be my problem. Logged in. Okay. What I did differently this time is I entered sudo because remember, I created the mount point in slash media, so I have to have super user access in order to access that as a mount point. So that said, now I've got pogo plug listed on my desktop, but I don't actually have read access to that because it's a super user only mount point. So I'm going to hit control C to abort the pogo plug, and I'm going to go sudo chmod. Actually, first I'm going to go sudo u mount just to be safe. I want to unmount that media slash pogo plug. Okay, and it says it's not mounted, but we're doing that just to be safe, just to make sure that it's not mounted. And then I'm going to go sudo chmod seven 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 slash media pogo plug, or we could use ch own if we don't want everyone on our computer to access it. But just to quickly go over what that means. I'm using super user and I'm saying I want to change the permissions of media slash pogo plug so that anyone on my computer can access that, anyone through my network can access that, etc. Okay, so now I'm going to do that command again with sudo before at this time. Okay. And if all goes well, this is live TV, baby. It's mounted, it seems. If you, if you have a case like I'm having there where I'm having security issues getting the mount point to allow me personally access, you can go through setting up the permissions on that mount point. Or alternatively, just for the sake of this, what I'll do is I'll create a mount point within your actual home folder. And then that way you know that you're going to have access to that. Look up uh, commands like chown if you want to put it into your, into your media folder. Let's go makedir, no sudo necessary now dot dot slash pogo plug. Okay, so now I've created a, a folder called pogo plug or a mount point called pogo plug in my home folder. So it's going to look like that. Okay, so now let's change our mount point. Let's get rid of sudo at the beginning there because I don't need it this time. And change our mount point to home Robbie pogo plug. Okay. And now you'll see because I've got a now I've created a mount point in a folder where I have full permission because it's my user. You'll see that I have exactly the same folder structure as I did on my Windows computer as I did when I logged into my Pogo plug. And if I go into no name, which is my drive, if you have more than one hard drive connected to this, it will be listed by the name of the drive. And now if I go in, there's the test folder. There's my test.txt. What do I want to do? I want to display it. And you'll see, there's my text file. That's some Hello, fine writing. Testing Pogo Plug. I was in a hurry. Nice, fine literature. Though. And that's my, that's my way out when I, when I mess up a little bit. I can say, oh, because I was just in a hurry, because I was doing a demo that's on what happened live with my TV. Tweet. 
That's what it was. <laughs> That's what happened with his tweet, people. So anyway, so there you go. So that gives you a kind of a base of how that works and how you can get that to work for you. Uh, and seriously, now that's on my Linux laptop, I can take that with me, I can have access to that. Uh, do keep in mind that the password is plain text on Pogoplug FS. So you want to change that password of your Pogoplug by logging into my.pogoplug.com should your devices ever get stolen or something along those lines. Um, so do be mindful of that. That's kind of the one downfall. I'm sure that we'll see some, uh, but that's only locally exposed, right? So only somebody who has physical access to your computer could ever see that. And that said, of course, the question would come up, how can I set it up to mount automatically? And you can do that uh, just by adding it as a startup application on your Linux computer. So just like you would with any startup application, you can add that. But do keep in mind, again, that the uh, password is going to be plain text. If you've got a, an encrypted home folder and you've got a password-protected login, then it's no problem because of the fact that you have to actually know your login in order to get into the computer which exposes the password. And so, typically, somebody's not going to have that. So, all right. Now, should you run through the GUI method for our uh, friends out there? No way. No? OK. Well, did somebody ask? Yeah. Really? Yeah. What's? Ah, <laughs> oh, Tom. Uh... Tom, you kid. <laughs> hey, Tom. Good to see you. There you go. So you're giving Tom a rough time now. Uh, totally. Totally. Okay. Hi, Tom. <laughs> I'm on your side. <laughs> He's no. probably still taking it easy. I, I'm, I'm over here working. So <laughs> hope you had a good Thanksgiving. All right. Was that? That was that. That was this weekend, wasn't it? Cheers. Yeah, it sure was. Um. Uh, quickie, unless uh, somebody in the chat room has got anything well, this, for me. This doesn't look quick. All right, well, we'll come back to it then. Let's leave that one. This is Category 5 Technology TV. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. We're just a couple of moments away from the news, so I don't want to get into anything too uh, right. too heavy uh, before that point, but if you have a question for us, live at category5.tv, uh, or, of course, in the chat room, category5.tv, or free node in the room, Category 5. We'd love to hear from you, uh, especially if this is your first time here. Uh, you can also submit a viewer testimonial on our website, category5.tv, and uh, click on Interact and submit a testimonial. And uh, that's a great opportunity for you to tell us what you think of the show. Lots of exciting stuff going on uh, over the next little while with uh, our new website. I see you've actually got an email from Tom. Well, I was going to say, you know, like, while we're all correcting each other here, um, he has a... I think there's a the picture there, but he says, Behold, the, the beacon, mushroom, and asparagus frittata. Ho oh, oh. ho! Check that out. I'm he's he, he's think relaxing he and he's eating well. Was oh, it bacon. It's bacon, not Canadian yeah. bacon, though. <laughs> <laughs> that looks delicious. Oh, oh. All right. Anyways, thanks for uh, making us all salivate there, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, Hillary, my dear. Hello. Hello, everyone. I'm ready for the news. Ready for the news? Who's with me? I think we are ready. Take it away. Uh, from the Category 5 TV newsroom. With the growing popularity of the e-bike, we'll no doubt see more Canadians making longer trips by bike come spring. And Google wants to help them get to their destination safely and on the best roads as possible. Canadian cyclists should note that Google's bike directions are coming to most of Canada's major cities, starting with Ottawa. Google Maps announced yesterday that their bike direction service, launched in the U.S. in March, is launching in eight Canadian cities. This feature uh, color codes roads according to their suitability for biking, helping cyclists find safer, more enjoyable routes for their two-wheeled journey. Google has yet to announce a schedule, but with another Canadian winter on the horizon, they've got several months to work out the bugs. Apple said yesterday that it plans to release the promised update to iOS 4.2 for iPad, iPhone, and iPod Touch. The update brings a number of long-awaited iOS 4 features to the iPad and adds the new AirPlay and AirPrint features for all iOS devices. In somewhat of a surprise, owners of the latest iOS devices can now use the Find My iPhone feature for free, allowing you to track down a missing device via core location and even remotely wipe the data. 
Features that iPhone and iPod Touch users have been enjoying since June's release of the iOS 4.0 will now be available to iPad users. This includes the iOS version of multitasking and fast app switching. The ability to organize apps into folders, a unified inbox, and threaded messaging for mail, and access to a game center for keeping track of game achievements, scores, and challenges. iOS 4.2 is compatible with all iPads, iPhone 3G, iPhone 3GS, iPhone 4, and second, third, and current generation iPod touches. Apple notes, though, that some features aren't compatible with every device. To get the upgrade, plug your device in, launch iTunes, and click up, Update Software button in the device setting. Bad news if you've been hoping for a Chrome-based note or netbook this Christmas. Unfortunately, they won't be ready in time. Google's Chrome operating system launch has been delayed, and the platform won't be available to launch on netbooks for at least the next few months. Google CEO Eric Schmidt revealed the news to reporters in a Q&A session at the Web 2.0 Summit last Monday, adding that the platform continues to be targeted toward devices with a keyboard, ruling out tablets, but keeping hope, uh, hopes high for the netbook market. With Google, While Google has announced last December that netbooks from big names such as Acer, Asus, HP, Lenovo, and Toshiba would launch Google Chrome's OS in time for Christmas of this year, Schmidt debunked the rumors without giving a reason for the delay. In time for the holidays, Amazon has made it possible for people to give Kindle books to anyone with an email address. The Kindle reader is the most popular of the ebook readers and has an estimated 725,000 books available for sale in its market. A Kindle isn't required to enjoy a Kindle book, as the Kindle apps for PC, Mac, and iOS, Windows, Phone 7, Blackberry, Android are available. They're not for Linux. And if you prefer something else, Kindle books can be exchanged for Amazon gift cards. Why should you give an ebook this holiday season? Well, for one, books are often cheaper. Sending an ebook takes much less effort than sending a real book. Gratification is instant, and shipping is free. So give the gift of digital literature this holiday season. Microsoft Windows operating system celebrated 25 years on Saturday. On November 20th, 1985, Windows 1.0 was released, birthing an empire and introducing GUI-based computing and rudimentary multitasking to MS-DOS users. Since the release of Windows 1.0, Microsoft has released a whopping 33 major uh, versions of its Windows operating system. Four known versions have been cancelled during this time, including Windows Neptune, which was merged with Windows Odyssey and developed into what we all know as Windows XP. While looking back over the 25 years is really quite amazing, Windows didn't take off really until Windows 3.0 was released in 1990, five years later after the first release of the Windows platform. What was the first version of Windows you used? Get the full stories at category5.tv slash newsroom. The Category 5 TV newsroom is researched by Roy W. Nash with contributions from Gadget Wisdom Guru, Becca Ferguson, and our community of viewers. If you have a news story you think is worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at category5.tv. From the Category 5 TV newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Category 5 TV is brought to you in part by Planet Calypso. This massive multiplayer online game is available as a free download from cat5.tv slash calypso. Now once you've got it downloaded and installed on your Windows computer, make sure you say hi. And there's something for everyone here on Planet Calypso, from hunting to mining, crafting, and just plain socializing and having fun with your friends. You can download it for free at cat5.tv slash calypso. If you're a Linux user like myself, of course this makes it worth the dual boot. cat5.tv slash Calypso. I'll see you on Planet Calypso. This is Category 5 Technology TV. You'll find us online at www.category5.tv. This thing just, I mean, it brings back so much memories. <laughs> but check out the logo, dudes. And dudettes. Absolutely. Come on. Be inclusive here. Does that, is it just me, or does this remind me of, oh, I don't know, something that may have, may have or may not have attacked Lieutenant Barkley oh. within the transporter stream? I don't know. Oh, wow. <laughs>
I don't know. It just that's that's just, kinda, just you. It just kind of yeah. seems reminiscent of these creatures. Yeah, I was getting a Space Invaders vibe from it. Yeah, <laughs> Realm of Fear, the episode of TNG. Oh, okay. that's what that logo <laughs> reminds me of. How deliciously random. I've got some. Yeah. TNG That's watching to catch up on it. You think. certainly do, sir. <laughs> you certainly do. Thanks so much, Hillary, for uh, pitching in with the news tonight. Hillary's uh, got to take off. But uh, nice to have her here, as always. It sure is. Yeah. Brilliant. All right, we've got so much to cover tonight. Uh, I want to take a look at DDWRT. I know you've got a couple of questions to, we uh, have a few to questions, address there. Yeah. Could we take a look at uh, Cola's email there, if, if we sure. could, just so that we can address that? Uh, nice to have you here. New viewer who's uh, joining us, I guess, has been watching the show. I'll let you kind of uh, fill us yeah, in by, by way of the email. It's Cola, and this came to us via email. Um, I'll just start reading. I registered yesterday as a new viewer on Category 5. I have viewed several past episodes of the program to catch up with what I have missed in the past and to continue watching live as from next Tuesday. Episode 111 caught my attention for some reason and I started to watch. To my greatest surprise, the guy that was interviewed on the GOIP stuff could only give Nigeria as his example of the location of a guy trying to commit a credit card fraud. Oh yes, I know it was just an example and I know a lot of guys from Nigeria have committed and are committing crimes like this on the internet. I just want him to know that he must watch how he picks his random names for examples. His example makes me think that he thinks Nigerians are fraudsters. If this is true, then I shouldn't bother to introduce other African IT guys like me to my newfound Category 5. Maybe I'm sounding a bit defensive for a mere example a guy used to illustrate the point he was trying to make, but you must know that the population of my beloved country is a 160 million and the few bad ones have really messed up the image of the rest of us. But this doesn't mean that the first name that should come to someone's mind when they think of credit card frauds is Nigeria. I know how you will take this, but I think my membership in this forum is still young and it's not a happy thing for me to hear a thing like this in less than 24 hours of my registration. Indeed. And that Cola, we I think appreciate all Cola rule. Well, we appreciate your candor. We appreciate your your message there, and certainly um, things like that can occur where something's said, and and I, I think that the intention behind what was said is nothing like um, the. And and you'll excuse this, but I, I don't think that it was intended to offend in any way. I know the example that uh, that Ed Lynn from Max Mind had provided, uh, who was interviewed in that show. Uh, certainly, he's, he was uh, somebody who came on the show as, uh, as an opportunity for him to promote his product, and, and we allow that uh, to, to occur, of course. Uh, in that case, I, I think he was just kind of drawing names out of the hat. It's kind of like if I, if I were to say, uh, in his example, he was saying that if somebody made a purchase in one location and the credit card was, in fact, from another location or vice versa, then that would be a red flag for them, that it would be right. possibly fraud. I don't think he was making, I, I, I don't want you to take the impression that he was saying that if the credit card transaction came from Nigeria that it's probably fraud. I don't think that was the point that he was making there. I think what he was rather saying is more, for example, if, if, if I see a transaction that's going through my server for a purchase um, and the user says that they're from Alberta, but then the credit card actually turns out to be from Ontario then it's just a red flag for me. I just know that something here doesn't match up. And I think that's, that was the mindset of the example. And, and I must apologize on behalf of Ed and on behalf of Category 5 for uh, the way that that was taken. And, uh, and I hope that you'll see past that as far as, I don't believe that it was intended as a, as a racial or, or uh, a slur towards, uh, towards your country. And uh, so I, I just apologize that it was taken that way. So, and I hope that you'll stick around. Yes, stick hope around. That, uh, you get a lot from the show. And certainly, you know, things like that can happen. We allow people on the show. Sometimes I say, I'm sure that I've said some things that I would go back and say, oh my goodness, I can't believe I said that, or it came out the wrong way, or I said, I meant to say it like this, but then something about the way that it came out just kind of sounded wrong. And, and so, you know, when that happens, I'm very sorry. Uh, but we certainly do our best to, to try to keep things um, neutral, and, and certainly we have 
uh, we have every respect for, for everyone in the world. And uh, very nice to have you here. Yeah, it's truly a cosmopolitan group. It really have, is. You know? It certainly so. is. And it goes for every country in the, in the world that's, that's watching the show. I'm constantly amazed at viewership from all over the world. I mean, we can look at our, our viewership right now, uh, Cola, and we've got uh, a huge amount of our viewers are from the United States. We've got viewers in China. They're our second country. Like, to me, that's hard to believe. Yeah. But that's, that's the way it is. I've got United Kingdom viewing the show regularly. The Netherlands. Canada is the fifth one down the list. That's where we're from. Yeah. You know? Germany. It's nice to have everybody viewing from Germany. We've got the Russian Federation, the Ukraine, Japan, and Israel. Those are our top ten countries right now, this month. And it blows my mind, and, and I appreciate every viewer, and I appreciate you being here, and I, and I do hope that, uh, that you will refer your friends and, and have them tune into the show and, and have your people represented here on Category 5. It would be nice to have you in the chat room at some point, if, uh, if ever. I know time zones are, uh, I guess we're about six hours probably off. I'm not, I'm not positive. But I haven't actually looked. No. We, we could do that. We could, but I, I think that, that's about it. But it's nice to have you here. All right? <laughs> Just wanted to touch on that, because I know that's... that's I, I know that that was a heartfelt email, and, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that that got addressed. Thank you. Actually, I don't think he was too hard on you. I, no, no, he you wasn't. You weren't hard on me. At all. He was honest. Yes, yeah, exactly. Absolutely. I, and yeah, got to respect that. Absolutely. Do we have time for a couple other questions? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, sir. We got well, we eighteen whole minutes. All right. Well, Pablo. Hey, Pablo. Maybe Pablo, but I think pa it's Pablo. Pablo. Yes. Um, Beg your pardon. He. Uh, writes, you said, hey, Vernon A., yep, I've done everything, hmm, let's get back here. Dear Robbie, thanks for, <laughs> we're, we're Okay, now we're bit. down to 14 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Dear Robbie, thanks for your time with this topic. I found in Telestream form. Okay, so, um, so, starts out, hey, Vernon A., yep, I've done everything logical to resolve this within Wirecast. I've toggled basically all settings from the quality of my video to the resolution to the respect aspect ratio to whatever else is in there. Turning off respect aspect ratio simply stretches the two-fifths screen, so now you still have only two-fifths the screen, but it fills the wirecast window. Sure hope I can get this working soon. Tough to hit snags like this when you broadcast every week. Thanks for your help. Hmm. Okay. The problem is that I have the same problem and Wirecast is only showing top half of the input in the BTWDM driver. Uh, were you able to solve this? I'm attaching an image showing the shot that has the problem. Thanks really so much. Regards, Pablo. Cheers, Pablo. I'm going uh, to check the email. Or maybe you can bring up the image, but uh, maybe let's I see can. what that is. And you, you read that with such passion. I, pr I appreciate that. <laughs> I, uh, I, I believe what is happening here is uh, Pablo is saying that, uh, referring to a thread that I posted to like two or three years ago, I, I believe, oh. and just asking for advice due to the problem that they're experiencing. Ah, I see. Yes. Can you see let's that? see. Yeah, and let's see if I can find this here. I may not be able to bring up the image for, for people, unfortunately. Here we go. Just bear with me one moment, and I appreciate that. Uh, I'm just going to try to get that email up on the screen here, just so that the viewers at home can see what it is that you're talking about here, Pablo. All right. So here's a screenshot that Pablo has provided. Got a connexent card, and it's showing basically in the middle. Looks like it's supposed to look like that, but it's actually looking like that. It's kind of squishing down in the middle. When I had that problem with Wirecast, Wirecast is a broadcasting tool that we use to create the show uh, live. It allows us to do the camera switching and all the fantastic effects and everything that you see here on the show, such as that. It's all live. When I had that kind of problem, it, it ended up being the driver for my device itself was not compatible with Wirecast. So I'd encourage you to try some different drivers and see if you can get find one that uh, that's a third-party driver that's going to assist you with that 
And certainly you can also turn off respect aspect ratio in uh, Wirecast, which I find also helps if the camera itself is reporting the wrong aspect ratio. You can also check the, the driver settings for your camera itself. Um, so uh, um, I guess you would call it the properties of the camera, which you'll find in Wirecast, in Wirecast under Asset Manager. Uh, you'll be able to um, configure those. And under Configure Devices, you should be able to do some other things. But under Asset Manager, certainly you'll be able to change uh, to 4 over 3. Looks like you're, it looks like you're doing 4 over 3 there. Um, so you'll want to change that device to 4 over 3 and, and manipulate your your settings for um, respect to aspect ratio. Kind of a tough one though, and not having direct access to, to your setup is, is kind of tough. I think it's going to be different for everyone, but for me when that happened, when cameras were showing squished or in the wrong, uh, flipped around for example, uh, it ended up being a driver for the particular capture card that I was using, which was a, a hop hog, uh, just a low-end hop hog card that I got for $60. That was the card that was causing me the grief. Replace the driver with an open source driver. I don't remember which one it was, uh, but I looked around. I found some drivers that were compatible with my card that were open source and that were developed by an open source community, and it gave me access to the card and let me use it, uh, and it worked really well. So good luck. I, I'm sorry I don't have a definitive answer for you, but hopefully that will uh, at least assist you with uh, with. Uh, achieving what it is you need to do with Wirecast. But certainly um, also a good idea to always stay on top of the latest version of Wirecast. I do find even uh, our Microsoft Life Cam we have had problems with from day one. And uh, I used to have to do the same thing where I had to use a third party uh, driver in order to get it to work. And that particular third party driver was finicky. If I accidentally closed it, it would crash the camera. And then you couldn't access no, the camera sure. without a reboot. So it was really finicky. With Wirecast, the latest update that I have, um, that problem is resolved. I no longer have to use that driver at all. I just use the direct Microsoft Life Cam pardon me, driver. So you may find that also an up update of your software would be a good idea. All right. Good luck. Um, I'd like to talk about DDWRT tonight. We're, we're running low on oh, time. Okay. So now I had the privilege of having our router fry itself last week. Remember a couple of weeks ago? If you were watching the show live, you may remember that uh, we had a night where the the feed kept on cutting out, and, and you know we were wondering if it was Justin.tv. We weren't sure what was going on, yes. and and I contacted my ISP, and and the ISP said actually your internet connection is dropping out at a regular interval. It's just cutting off and then reconnecting. So it turned out that was a big part of the cause, obviously. Oh. Looking into it further, last week we did the show, everything worked just fine, uh, and then started having some more trouble and determined that our router was actually about to kick the bucket. So, uh, preemptive strike, uh, went out and uh, started doing some shopping for a new router. And how did I pick my router? Well, how did you pick your router? All right, I got a, I got a Netgear. This is the WNR3500L. I don't even know the model off by heart yet. There it is. You can take a look at that. All right. Ooh. I'm very interested in the DDWRT firmware. What that is is it's a, a firmware from dd-wrt.com that takes your out-of-the-box router and allows you to add features that are so far beyond what the out-of-the-box router contains because the manufacturers want you to buy the one step up. They want you to buy the better model, the more expensive model, obviously. Of course. But did you know that the hardware generally is all the same across the board? It's the software that's installed on the firmware. So by using DDWRT, you're able to take an old router and you're able to turn it into something beautiful. That's what I've done in the past and that's, that's what I have been running for the longest time. I had an old Motorola device that was completely dead with the stock firmware. Gave it a shot, installed DDWRT and we've got a couple of years out of it before the hardware finally kicked the bucket. So that's been great. It gave me a lot of new features. So the things that you want to look for as you buy a router is what features do you want out of DDWRT? And the way to determine that is if you go to their website, and I'm going to post some links in the show notes for episode number uh, 166, but basically there's a supported devices list, and this list gives you a lot of information about all different devices, and this is extensive. I mean, it's a huge, huge table. It's my little Linksys, whatever model it is. You may even have it in there, yeah. Certainly, if you've got an old router, you may try checking if it's already 
in there. So you may not have to go out like I did and buy a new one. Oh. In my case, my hardware was dying, and so I, I needed to get new hardware. So in that case, I'm taking the first step of deciding, okay, I've got to buy one anyway. Let's pick one that's going to work really, really well for what I want to do. So there's a, a link that says, which version may I flash? And that tells you a little bit about the different versions of DDWRT. And you'll notice, do not flash the mega build on devices with four megabytes of flash memory. That's like my old one. Mega requires eight megabytes or more flash. So then you have to ask yourself, okay, well, what is this mega? What does this mean? And what, uh, what, what, do, what version do I want? We want to determine, okay, well, can I get away with the four megabyte router? which is basically every router that's on the shelf. Okay. Or do I need to go a step further and find one that is going to give me access to bigger features from this mega? So what I want to do and what I did, let's see if I can find the list here. What's that? This has got the 8 meg. This one does. I went with the 8 megs, and I'll show you why. I'm going to see if I can find the page here. Just for the sake of speed, I'm going to use Google. DDWRT version comparison. Let's see what we can find. What version should I download? That's what I'm looking for here. They've got a really, a really well-detailed site, but I do find it's a little bit convoluted as to finding the actual information. So that's why I'm going to put some links in the show notes of episode number uh, 166 for you to make things a little bit easier to, uh, to find. Let's see. Here we go. So with this file, you'll see that it compares micro, micro plus, micro plus SSH, mini, mini hotspot. Yes, you can create your own hotspot with these, with this firmware. Mini USB, USB generic, and all these different versions all the way up to big and mega. So you start going down this list of features that you can add to your router, even asterisk, being able to turn your, your router into its own PBX, dynamic DNS, EXT3 support, IPv6, which normally you'd have to pay for a higher end router to get that kind of feature. Here's one of the kickers for me, Pro FTPD. Being able to deprecate the fact that I have a, a big old Dell server sitting in, in there with FTP installed, okay. and it's just giving people access to my FTP server. That's using a lot of hydro. Imagine if I could deprecate that completely and just put this on a little solid state device with no moving parts, very little heat generated, very little yes, power yes. consumption. All of a sudden, DDWRT starts saving me money because I can install features like that so that I can create an FTP server on my solid state device. Cool. Continuing down the list, more features that you that you get is QoS quality of service and it's quite an advanced one. And you see that okay, this is available in mini and micro, micro plus, mini, and you can All see the the with the dot that that's available in every in every one. But then Pro FTPD, you'll see it's available in USB generic, mini USB FTP, big and mega, okay? Where the dots are. So that tells me that if I want to be able to use this, I have to find a piece of hardware that's compatible with one of those versions of DDWRT. So with the router database, when you go to their website, you'll see the supported devices so list. They're not telling you that on the box, are they? <laughs> Usually they don't. In this case, they did. This one it brags that they're open source compatible, and, and that's great. I like that. Um, but in a normal case, it's not going to say that. But what you can do is you can hit Control F, and you're you're going to find the name of your router. So WNR 3500L is the router that I purchased, and you'll see. Here's what I'm looking for. It's got 64 megs of RAM, 8 megabytes of flash. And you'll remember that we already learned that with 8 megs or or more of flash, I can go with the mega. You can do mega. Yes. You can see what other features it has. So I looked at. It's got four LAN, one WAN, and it's a gigabit switch. So that tells me that, okay, not only am I going to be getting all the advantages of DDWRT with the mega install, or in this case, the big install, but also I'm able to um, 
I'm able to uh, upgrade my network to gigabit because it's got that built in. It's not going to cost me any more. So the installation procedure, once you determine the version of DDWRT that you would like, it has to be compatible. Be very careful that you get a version that is compatible with the router, and, and we can help you with that, but certainly DDWRT's site has all the information that you need. Once you have that information, you can log into the router. Here I am logging into the router as I was about to update um, the firmware. So this is right out of the box, brought it home, plugged it in, and get into my Netgear router. And all I had to do after, of course, I had downloaded the, uh, the firmware, but I go through the step of basically going through a router upgrade. So just like I would if I was just updating to a regular firmware, I'm doing that with my router here. So instead of browsing for a firmware from Netgear, I'm in fact going to browse for the DDWRT uh, file. In my case, I had to use an interim uh, file in order to be able to convert the, uh, the router over. So it's, it starts with mini, and then you upgrade from there to the, uh, to the big install, which gives me the Pro FTP and all that stuff. Uh, and, and it's really that simple. I'm going to speed it up uh, just a little bit here so that uh, you can see the installation procedure, but it, that it won't take too long. It's just prompting that you're installing a different version of the firmware there. So this is how it works on Netgear. It's pretty much the same with any, uh, any router at all. And again, as long as you've got the, the proper version, which you've downloaded from the DDWRT website, absolutely free of charge, it's going to install on your, on your router. There we go, nice and fast. <laughs> wow. Didn't really go that fast. Didn't take long, though. It took a couple minutes. You see there the countdown, 1.5 minutes. So now as it, up, it says it's updating settings, and then boom, all of a sudden, DDWRT is installed on my router. So then I zoom in on that frame because it got put into a frame, and there we go. It's in the mini version. So then I would go through the uh, installation step there, go into administration, and go through the firmware update to the big version of DDWRT. So I downloaded two files in this case. So that gives me access to some fantastic features. You saw the, the chart there. But now, if I access my router, going to enter my password here to get in. You'll see that right off the bat you get the status of your, your router. You've got your wireless network. You've got your services. Services is fantastic. You've got so much stuff that you can do with a DDWRT router from VPN to static IP addresses based on MAC address, something that certainly you would need a, a higher end router for. You've got your USB, which Everything's kind of Ajax based here, so if I go core USB support, enable. Do I want USB 1.1? Yeah. You know, if I want storage support, I can enable that. And I can go through all the steps, you know, from there once I've enabled that. Do I want Linux file system support? Yeah. Do I want file allocation table, Windows, uh, DOS file system support, etc. Automatic drive mounting. Even the ability with, with this version, I can actually use CIFS or Samba and automatically mount my unraid server to a mount point on my firewall. Because it's Linux, right? DDWRT is powered by Linux. I can SSH into it. I can telnet into it. I can, like I say, mount my unraid server to it. I could mount my pogo plug to it. So then all of a sudden it becomes a server where I can access or share or uh, give FTP access to files to users through a solid state device, cutting down on the hydro that I have to use and giving myself a whole lot of professional features in what was a, f a reasonably inexpensive modem. I did a comparison between multiple different types of modems. I've, I picked the ones that would be, <coughs> would do what I need to do. And you'll see here that I did a, a pros and cons of each one. So good to go. This modem costs, uh, this router cost me uh, $119 and is doing a fantastic job for us and uh, works fantastic. really well. Fantastic. Yeah. So very happy with that. Check it out, dd-wrt.com. Don't forget to check out our website this week, category5.tv, and make sure you get your name in for the draw for the brand new MFC J615W printer from Brother Canada and Category 5 TV. You'll find that at the bottom of the Interact menu. Have a fantastic week. It's been nice having you here. Drop me an email live at category5.tv this week and get your questions in. We'll try to catch up with those questions that I missed this week. Absolutely. All right. Take care. Have a good week. See you Tuesday.